but I want to see oh the chat yeah what people say how many developers does it get does it take to get audio to work on a live stream apparently three <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone in this room with us we we really do appreciate you at this point this is a part of the show um okay so Dorlin see if you can tap the top of your mic all right now speak okay so your mic is on now but maybe the bottom see if you can turn the knob okay all right yes. so that's exactly what it is wow oh my gosh there's no like tactile the like haptic feedback or anything from the thing i hadn't i think i accidentally just touched the top before yes okay. i think i think that's probably what it is there's no haptic feedback um so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do today i'm gonna have everyone introduce themselves for those who do not know them so today what we're working on is we're gonna be looking at all of the disabilities, the different types of disabilities and the assistive technology that comes with it. Um, and then if we have time, we're gonna talk a little bit about disability etiquette. And it's gonna be hilarious because if you were here last week with me and Dorlin, we were talking about um, being blind and like what comes with how people treat you. I found this hilarious PDF that I'm gonna share with everyone of what not to do when interacting with people with disabilities and it and it literally said like three of the things that Dorlin um that Dorlin talked about all right so the last thing is um because we do have people who are who cannot see the screen they may be blind um, I'll be a little bit more verbose in how I explain everything so I'm going to be reading the chat so that Dorlin can hear what's going on in the chat, and then I'll, whenever there's anything on the screen that needs to be explained, I'll probably explain it with a little bit more detail, um, just, so you'll, just so you all are aware. All right, so very quickly, I'm gonna kind of look at these uh, messages and just make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, when it comes to the stream, remember, you can always ask questions and make comments. That's what's gonna make it more interesting and help us learn a little bit better. Um, after we do introductions, we're gonna go back a little bit for a couple minutes and we're gonna break out our Anki and do some space repetition. Um, last week when we left off, we didn't have any time or energy for um, doing the Anki notes because we had been on there for like two and a half hours or something. Um, and then Jamil, who is gonna be a little bit late today, I think he said that that he was gonna be like oh, 30 minutes late. Um, so. He uh, suggested that we do that at the top of each stream, and I thought that was a good idea. So let's go ahead and do that. But before we do that, Dorlin and Brandy, starting with Dorlin, since you're first on the screen, go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Dorlin. Uh, I work in um, 508 Compliance with Africa and Brandy here. Um, so we do web accessibility and document accessibility. Um, I joined the field only as a professional a few months ago, but I started learning about web accessibility and coding about three years ago. I've gone through the DEC courses to do a lot of their like accessibility stuff, including the CPAC, um, but never actually took the CPAC. So I'm looking forward to studying with everyone here. And then I'm also blind, so I'm a native user of assistive technology and um, definitely looking forward to the disability etiquette if we get into that. Um, and I guess I was thinking I'd already introduced myself last week, so I wasn't even prepared to do this. Oh, good. They don't to need a, a, large, a large introduction. All right, you got me there. <laughs> All right, Brandy. Uh, so I am Brandy. As Dorlin already said, I work with both Africa and Dorlin in 508 accessibility, and I worked with Africa before. We went through 100 devs together. 100 devs in the building! Hey! hey. And I have a background uh, coming out of uh, exercise rehabilitation as a physical therapist. And I specifically worked in skilled nursing, which is like 90% geriatrics. So I got to see 
the whole run of everything from the whole span of life. Yes, and it's it's Dr. Brandy, y'all. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Dr. Brandy. That's what our PM calls her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Graham had a nice comment that I wanted to share. He said, wouldn't it be good accessibility, a good accessibility feature if the HyperX mics didn't just rely on a light to let you know if they're on or muted? Yes, I like the idea of that haptic feedback. That'd be great. <laughs> Poor Darla, there she's we like, is it on? <laughs> It's also nice when there's like a physical switch. So you can like on the iPhone, so you can literally tell by just touching it if it's on and off without having to toggle back and forth too. Right. But there's so many times where I'm just like, I just want to know if I'm muted or not without letting everyone know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Dorlin, also lift your camera up just a little bit. So we can see your, the top. Of your, all right. That's good. Slightly down, Ooh, just slightly. Sorry, sorry it's a lot right there. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. I'm gonna change my screen to the shared. And we're gonna get a little bit tiny, which is fine. But we can still hear y'all and i think we're on the wrong screen so i'm gonna fix that because you guys are looking at my video ninja and that's not what i want you to see we're gonna go to samsung display capture blim blau all right can everyone <laughs> see my powerpoint my beautiful powerpoint let me know yep looks like you can all right, so where we left off was vision disabilities. So we saw vision disabilities. We talked about assistive technology with Dorland. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go up a little bit and we're gonna break out Anki. So if you're with me right now and you have Anki downloaded, um, pull up Anki. If you don't have Anki downloaded and you're taking physical note cards, pull out your note cards, if you're using a, a book or writing it down, <laughs> whatever you need. Um, the way that we do this is, here goes my seek pack right here. And we're going to add to this. All right. So what we remembered was that for the CPAC, they get really detailed really, really detailed when we're taking the test. So we're trying to get down a lot of like information that are like statistics or numbers. <laughs> so that's why we're doing this. I feel like we can start at the medical model. Let me go to study now. Let me just see where I stopped off. What is the medical model? We already got that one. Well, actually, since I'm in my Anki, let's do it together and then we'll start adding them. Um, since you can already see this, I'm going to do another one. This one's easy for me, so I'm going to put easy. All right. Can anyone tell me what the social model is? Does anyone remember? Okay, so Graham said that disability is created through barriers in society. Let's see what it says. Dan King Code said, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, you're about to learn. Okay, so the social, model, the social model puts the ball in society's court. Accessibility isn't an individual's problem. Rather, it's caused by society. We need to design things that are accessible for all, not just the majority. All right, so Graham was right. Also, as you guys know, if you see typos, oh well, sorry. <laughs> All right, what is the biopsychosocial model? This one's a good one. Let's see who remembers. What is the biopsychosocial model? So that means I think we went through most of the models on here. 
All right, plants and pajamas said combination of the medical model and social model. And Graham said, not a clue. Well, you got one, Graham, so you're good. <laughs> All right, combination of the medical model and the social model. Yes. Can anyone elaborate, including Dorlin or Brandy? I feel called out all of a sudden. Um, I was going to say it might be useful to know who defined it, and it has an acronym that I forget. <laughs> ICF yes. is that acronym, although I cannot define said acronym. Africa? Um, I do not remember either. Uh, all right, I'm going to find Coke. it real fast. <laughs> Kathy Coates yes. says, a person's medical status and environment. And Dan Code said, bio, arrow to medical, social, arrow to social. All right, let's see. I'm just going to see. I would throw in there. There's also, it is biopsychosocial. So it is how disability affects the individual's perception of like self and abilities. Right. So my, my, the way that I remember it is, it takes in the person's psychological well-being in their health, but also their physical well-being and health and kind of puts all that together um, and also takes into account their community um, and family and friends. According to the word biopsychosocial, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just let's see. All right. And so I have the answer to ICF. OK, we're the- going to. We're gonna ask you after I um after we say what this is. So ICF. All right. So the biopsychos biopsychosocial model is integrating the social, medical, and psychological model model. It analyzes the disability in its complexity. It assigns the problem to the society and the person's medical status. Oh, Kathy Coles is pretty right. I don't know if you were looking at your notes or not, but that was pretty spot on. Um, what is ICF, Dorlin? It is the International Classification of Functioning. Okay, not gonna remember. I wonder if we have to know that. Oh no. I think that might be important for this one. I could see it popping up. Okay, y'all. So I'm gonna add that to my inky. What, let me move this out the way a little bit so I can type well. Okay, so what is ICF? Is that what it is? The ICF is International Classification of Functioning. What is the ICF? All right, add in that. Okay, let's do this. I think I'm gonna put good for this one. What's the economic model? Oh, Kathy Coe said she, re- or they reviewed uh, cards just before the session, smart. <laughs> what is the economic model? I think this one's the one of the easier ones because it's just one thing you have to remember. Let's see if anyone in the crowd remembers. Plants and Pajama said, economic model, how well a person can participate in capitalism, make money. <laughs> Kathy Coach said, cost of state and employer. Yep. Sounds about right. Defined by a person's inability to work or participate in work, assess an individual's productivity and economic consequences to state and employer. Kathy (laughs) Coat. Really, I love it. All right. This is how you know that Anki works. (laughs) I mean, it does. That's, I don't even know what to say about it other than it just works. (laughs) What is the functional solutions model? Ooh, it's me. (laughs) <laughs> all right does anyone remember this one it's in the name kind of right. oh cj dreams 83 said see what people with disabilities can do and give them tools to alter their environment to help it is a result oriented strategy to disability it can be measured because it yields results and addresses the problem with the solution but can be held back by entrepreneurs or overly creative solutions that aren't practical. No, don't copy and paste. (laughs) I was like, this is really detailed. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. We appreciate it. Let's see. All right, this is a literal copy and paste. That's funny. Okay, I can't remember who I got this from. It might've been Jamil. 
Um, but yeah. <laughs> or okay, you came up with it. Okay, then it's yeah, okay I was gonna say to that's you. just a summary of everything, I think. Yeah. But I think well when done. we were doing the stream, I copied and pasted their their answer. Wait, you said just you know what? They said just kidding. I don't know what's real anymore. Let's move on. What is a social identity or cultural affiliation model? I like this one. I think it's interesting. Plants and Pajamas said, creating community based on shared disability experiences. Yes, we talked a lot about that last week. We talked about how Dorlin, um, <laughs> there's Braille beef, <laughs> which was funny. Um, and then we talked about the deaf community um, and the blind community a little bit. So that was, that was interesting to learn about. Kathy Coach said, having a sense of identity through disability, like the deaf community can be, but it can be alienating though. Okay, yep. So what we're doing here, as we're going through, we're thinking about what's good about these models and what's bad about these models. And I think that's important because they put it in the CPAC. So that's something to consider when you're studying. All right, so it says, when the individual embraces their disability as part of who they are, it's a model of disabilities where people can develop their identity around their disability and form communities of people with similar disabilities. But like Kathy Code said, it can be alienating. All right, what's the charity model, AKA the model that we just not feel in? unless they can get us something really cool that we need, but still, they need to be in the trenches with us if they're gonna do charity. <laughs> Robel said, aw, oh, poor you, yes. <laughs> Kathy Coe said, needs outside assistance equals good, no, good equals people contribute to charities but it can be condescending yes it can be condescending i think i wrote something snarky here what did i write all poor those disabled folks i think that was from dorlin's mouth <laughs> all those poor disabled folks all right i'm gonna put that as easy cj dream said treats disability as unfortunate and tragic yes so there's a there's a way that the charity model can work but that is hard to come by, I would say. All right, we're gonna put this as easy. Okay, y'all, what is, what is the ICF? I forgot already. <laughs> I forgot already. I remember, but I gave the answer the first time, so maybe someone else wants to Oh get yeah, it. let's see. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. <laughs> so I don't wait around for like someone to remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kathy Coates said, International classification of functioning. Robel said international something. I know the international part. Is it so the way that I'm going to remember it is ICD is the international classification of now I'm going to forget disease. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I just ICD. because okay. I know ICD tens. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so probably similar folks. Okay. All right, I'm going to remember that. I have a cat on my knee. This is very important. It is important. Can we see? Actually, sorry, y'all. We're gonna we're gonna go big a little just just for now. <laughs> oh, cat moment. God. Cats are always welcome on stream. Okay, my cats are napping though. They're they're not usually they're around here, but they're, it's daytime. They're like it's yeah. nap time. All if right. anybody uh, <clears throat> sees my my avatar on Twitch, it's that one. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go or back Discord. to share. <laughs> and we're going to go where we left off and just do a few more Anki cards together. So we talked about the types of disabilities and the personas, but I think we only did blind, so we don't need to do that much. But we're going to do some statistics on here. So we're going to add some based off of what we learned. 
And I think the one that we talked about, um, Kathy Coe said, at least they're not knocking over plants this week. Yeah, thank goodness. They're just, they're, I don't know, they're, I guess they're worn out. They're like very cute right now. Um, <laughs> the one that we spent a lot of time on last week was talking about how many people were blind, right? We were like way off, well, I was way off. Um, so the first question I think would make sense. What do you think, Dorlin? How many people have vision impairments? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. How many people have vision impairments? Okay. So you already kind of saw it, if you can see my screen, but what's the answer, y'all? I remember. Let's see if anyone. But that's anyone because I was so incredulous the last time. <laughs> yeah. The number of 43 visually... million. Oh my God. Kathy Coates said 43 million. Oh my goodness said 2.2 billion. And that's how I know you were here last year. <laughs> oh my gosh. So many people are like, 2 billion. There's 2 billion. <laughs> I think it was Jamil. They were like, 2 billion? So 20% of the world is blind? <laughs> Oh, Cinotech dead. Yeah, so Cinotech is back. Yes. One quarter of the world is blind. You heard it here first. I no, was going to say, we million. said vision impairments. And well, I would say if we're going vision impairments broadly, like I count, I'm nearsighted. My driver's license says I need corrective lenses. Right. I think the statistic is... 2.2 billion have some form of vision loss. Um, have at least, um, a, what is it? A vision impairment or blindness. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally said that to wrong, y'all. I meant how many people are blind. So yeah, you're right. It is 2 billion. I think I had 2 billion people were blind the first time. <laughs> but it's 2.2 billion for how many people have vision impairments. Thank you for correcting me, Graham. <laughs> All right, so how many people have the vision impairment of blindness? That would be 43 million. Was that something we found from the uh, the body of knowledge? Um, I don't remember that 43 million World number. Health Organization. Oh, that's the one we Googled last week, gotcha. Yes, um, I think the 2.2 billion and since we're all here, I'm just gonna pull up the body of knowledge to make sure that this is a relevant question. All right, here goes the blind one. Visual, okay. Yes, so this is on here. I think we need to know that 2.2 billion people have a vision impairment. Um, let's see if they talk about blind. Yes, so low vision is 24, 246 million people or 3.5 of the world's population have low vision. that different from okay I'm not gonna lie I and someone can be clear for me um <laughs> it says globally at least 2.2 billion people have a vision impairment or blindness right of whom at least 1 billion have a vision impairment that could have been prevented or has yet to be addressed but then down here for low vision, it says 246 million people or 3.5 of the world's population. Did we get the number wrong? 
This is from the uh, the CPAC Body of Knowledge, by the way. The the two hundred and forty six. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so or my goodness said CPAC differentiates low vision and blindness as separate disabilities. Of 2.2 billion, 246 million are categorized as low vision. Okay. Okay. Got it. That makes sense to me now. So these are the figures that we do need to know. So let's let's put them in. Put them in. Um, Graham said, so vision impairment can be short or long sighted. Low vision means an impairment that is significant enough that corrective lenses alone are not sufficient to fix. Okay, I think I was just reading this wrong. I see now it's differentiating both. All right, all right. All right, so I'm just gonna put how many people have low vision? And that would be 246 million people or 3.5 of the world's population. All right, Let's see. So then let's just get into the nitty gritty of just what is low vision. And Sinotech has pretty much said that in Graham. So it's basically uncorrectable vision loss that interferes with daily living and cannot be corrected by regular glasses or medication. I'm gonna just copy and paste it in there. All right, let's move on to, okay, what is the leading cause of blindness? Dorlin. I, my jaws just got a notification, talked over you. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, for those unaware, Dorlin is currently multitasking. Most of the time she's multitasking. She's using a screen reader to read everything that's happening on her computer. Just so y'all know. Um, so what is the leading cause of blindness? Ooh, I believe that was oh, that something unrefracted. Yep. And ah, uh, what was the exact name of it though? It's actually one that I haven't come across much in my like travels with other blind people, but uh, Unrefracted. Uncorrected. No, oh, right. Um, but for, and then uncorrected cataracts. I think it's, I, think is one. I wonder if I wrote this wrong. I put uncorrected refractive errors and cataracts. <laughs> so I'm gonna look at the CPAC. Here it is. All right. Body of knowledge. Due to unaddressed refractive error, as well as near vision impairment caused by unaddressed, oh my gosh, prostopia. Hmm. All right, let me pull, pull this back up. Where did I put it? Here we go. Oh. oh. Oh, I was lying. Those are the those were the ones that are uncorrect. Those were the leaders of the uncorrected vision loss. Yep. The leading causes of vision impairment are uncorrected refractive errors. Yep. And cataracts. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the majority of uh, people who are vision impaired are over forty. Over fifty. I mean, over fifty. Um. Uncorrected. Refractive errors. Gonna remember that one. Uncorrected refractive errors. I That's hope I'm one. gonna remember that. 
Um, Graham said, I'm going to guess diabetes. That's a good guess because that's what I would have guessed too. So actually, Graham's right in the U.S. anyways. Diabetes just surpassed um, macular degeneration as the number one uh, cause of blindness here. Mm. And I'm one of them. Wow. Wow. Um, so Graham said, so is refractive error is a posh way of saying you need your lenses to be adjusted, i.e. laser eye surgery. CJ Dream Dreams said, I was thinking that as well, Graham. I actually don't even know. Can we just Google this really fast? Yes. Where is Get a okay. diagram on the screen. Ref uncorrected refractive error. I feel like I cannot trust this uh, Google Bard because they gave us the wrong information last time. <laughs> but um, what causes it? Eyeball length, problem with the shape of the cornea, aging of lenses. It sounds like it's a, a physical, something physical going on with the eye where it's too large or too small in the shape of the, the cornea, interesting. So the part that normally clears and helps the eye focus, aging of the lens is also one that happens. Hmm. All right, let's move on to colorblindness. What oh, is, yeah. I feel like I am not gonna waste my card on what is colorblindness, because I can answer that. Um, Graham said, okay, so it is a cover all for the eye not being able to focus correctly due to focal length act. Um, it sounds like a cover all for, well, I guess for it not to be able to, to focus due to like aging or, or shape or whatever. Yeah, I would say so. Seems like it. Sinotech said, it's because the lens of your eyes changes and you can't focus on the right things anymore. So you wear glasses to adjust the degree the light hits your eyes. Uh, is this just like regular like eyesight problems but they said it and then <laughs> no wonder Graham said that now I'm like that's what it is yeah okay Kinda how does. many <clears throat> what is the most co uh, common form of colorblindness I find that's an easy one so I won't take it Red, green, yep. All right, we're only gonna spend like two more minutes on this and then we're gonna dive into where we gotta go. I see a lot of people saying red, green, you are correct. And um, Ali Herrera said, my twin brother has that. Oh, wow. Red, green, all right. How many, what is the statistics of males um, who have colorblindness? And then females, we'll put them in the same one. The ratio, is that a better way of saying it? Sinotech said one in 12, one in 200. Yep, one in, one in, well, yeah, I know I can, I know you guys can see it on my screen. We're just doing angry right now. <laughs> We're not trying to recall. We're gonna recall these to, uh, next week. So that's, that's why you can see it, but oh. it's still nice to say it out loud. So you can kind of remember. Okay. So we may not get through all of the vision stuff just so we can jump into what we're doing. So what, what our homework is going to be for all of us who are using Anki or who are studying seriously is to go through vision disability barriers and then go through the assistive technology for um, for the blind uh, and for vision for low vision um, and do Anki for that. All right, y'all. All right. So we're gonna move on and we're gonna start with auditory disabilities. I'm gonna talk a little bit about auditory disabilities. And on my screen to show that I have a little meme because y'all know I love memes. 
and the text says when you just made someone repeat themselves three times but you still don't know what they said and it's like Chrissy Teigen with um <laughs> with her face looking like what's going on uh awkward <laughs> all right auditory disabilities I actually have an auditory disability I wonder if it's on here um let's start with uh an easy one deafness that's I think an easy concept to understand it's total loss of hearing um they either use sign language and usually if they're using sign language it's because they lost their hearing earlier in life um as you lose your hearing later in life you usually um speak or figure out a way to communicate in that way um, and then you may learn sign language. All right, then we have hard of hearing. Hard of hearing is hearing loss ranging from mild to severe. You still have some useful hearing, essentially. Um, you can use a phone. You can communicate through sign language if that's easier. Um, you can use hearing aids. So there's some type of corrective hearing going on that can be corrected, whereas deafness is total loss. All right, then we have cent central auditory processing disorder. This is what I have. <clears throat> um, it's when you have a greater than expected difficulty hearing and understanding speech without hearing loss. Um, auditory processing disorder is not an inability to hear, but to understand. And I thought that was really interesting because I, at some point, um, <laughs> thought that I was losing my hearing. Um, and then I did testing and we realized it wasn't that I couldn't hear people, it's that I wasn't processing what was being said, especially if there was a lot of crowds around. <clears throat> so actually at, at our job that me and Brandy um, and Dorland work at was the first time where I like talked about it because I couldn't really understand what everyone was saying to me when I first um, started working because they were giving me a lot of um, auditory input with no visuals. So they would explain something and I wouldn't really understand it. And then after a while, I just like told everyone, well, not everyone, but whoever I was talking to at the time that um, that's that that was my issue that I was having. And they were so nice um, and kind of like accommodated me and try to find a different way to explain things to me where there were visuals. And I, was, I just remember that I, was, I almost cried because I, I felt so good about it. And it was something that I don't, I don't really share with people. Um, but now I share it because I'm just like, whatever. But it is something. So Sinotech said, um, it, no, Kathy Code said, it seems common in those who have ADHD and ASD. So yes, it's very common for um, people with autism and ADHD and any neurodivergent person really to have auditory um, processing issues. Um, so it, feel, it seems like the person can't hear you. It behaves as though they, there's hearing loss. Um, they, can locate, uh, they can locate the sound um, and most of the time understand what someone says, but responding may be difficult. So they may need more time to process what's being said as you say it. So even though you're talking with someone and you're talking regularly, they may need like an extra 10 seconds to like parse through what you said. All right, so let's talk about auditory barriers. Um, auditory barriers include speakers in a large space without amplification and unavailability of sign language interpretations, environments with loud competing sounds, websites or tech that require voice for interaction or understanding, video presentation without captions or translations, media players without captions, volume, color, or size options. Okay. All right, so we're gonna skip down to the assistive technology used for them. All right, so here's the auditory assistive technology. I have three pictures up here. One is a picture of um, a boy wearing a, a hearing aid. Cochlear implant? Yeah, so he has the, the co I always mess that word up. Can you say it for me, Brandy? Cochlear. Cochlear implant. Yes. So that is one of the pictures. We also have a telephone with really large buttons and then the telephone has um, text output. So I'm guessing that is showing the person what the other person is saying um, so that they can use the phone correctly. 
They also have these amplifiers and more amplifiers. So these switches right here, you can raise the volume um, and things like that. And then we have these accessibility symbols that I thought was interesting to kind of add on here. The international symbol of access for hearing loss, um, assistive tech listening devices and et cetera. Things like closed captioning, open captioning. These are kind of symbols that you may have seen around, but never knew what they meant. Just like Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Coase just said that. She's seen them, um, these symbols, but never knew what they meant. So yeah, these symbols, when you see them, they're for um, deaf, for the deaf community or the hard of hearing community to understand like what's going on. All right. Can you give me an audio description of what the international symbol is? Okay, so- Like I've seen the CC for closed captioning before, but I'm not familiar with that other one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through all of them. Um, the international symbol of access for hearing loss is like a square, it's blacked out with a white ear outline. And then it has like a white bar going through the ear, but you can still see the ear. Um, assistive listening devices, it looks the same except this inverted. So the background's white and the outline of the ear, I think that's, yeah, the outline of the ear is black. And instead of the white bar going through, it's like a dotted black line. And then above the ear part is like two lines. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining this. But <laughs> um, there's a telephone typewriter one where it's a symbol of a, of a telephone going down over a keyboard. Like, I guess that's what, a, like keyboard keys. And then volume control telephone is a telephone with like speaker lines coming out of it. And then the last one is sign language interpretation provided. And it's two hands with the okay symbol, but they're like one hand has the okay symbol going up and then one hand has the okay symbol going down. And then the closed captioning and open captioning um, are this just the letters. Cool, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, let's talk about assistive technology for auditory disabilities and adaptive strategies. So before we do that, my friends, what's the difference between assistive technology and adaptive strategies? I'm gonna see if anyone can answer that first. And then you're gonna toss it to the rehab specialist. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, it's gonna be you, Brandy. Brandy's taking over. No more me. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anyone remember the difference between assistive technology and adaptive strategies? All right. I don't see anyone answering. So, okay. Kathy Codes said... They think one is a tool and the other one is a routine. Okay. Sinotech said assistive technologies are tech that help people adapt to the situation and adaptive strategies is changing the environment to the respective disability. Okay. That's a good one. Brandy, how would you say that in your own words? I would probably be pretty close to Kathy Codes. Um, I think of assistive technologies as you know the things that you might have that would help you with a disability that you have um, and then adaptive strategies being more uh, you know the things that you or other people around you might do to to help uh, and I I think some of them get fuzzy like there are things in the middle yeah yeah there are <clears throat> and we'll see that when we go over here um, Ali Herrera I think Allie is a PT, actually, or a SLP. I'm pretty sure PT. But Ali Herrera said, hmm, assistive technology is the actual devices. Adaptive strategies is solutions on different ways to do things like ADLs, which are activities of daily living. So, yeah, Allie is a PT, too. We got two PTs in the building, y'all. <laughs> All right, so let's go to are adaptive strategies and assistive tech. So the assistive tech that we have are assistive listening devices. We saw a few pictures of those. Um, assistive, those, those listening devices include like the cochlear implants 
They include regular hearing aids, um, and then they have headphones that amplify sound. Um, they have text-to-speech. So if someone is not able to speak and is a sign language user, they can still you know, write or type, and that is a good way for them to be able to kind of have that output. Um, Noise-canceling headphones is another. So when we talk about adaptations, we have transcriptions, audio controls, captions for videos, video conference for signing, and note-taking apps. Hello, RoboDom, good to see ya. All right, so my cat's here, y'all. So if anything starts yes. going crazy, it's because she's all over my keyboard. Um, <laughs> actually, you guys can say hi to her because she's the cutest. It's a cat break. <laughs> Rachel. She's like furring so hard right now. It's so funny how she just like, she's like, all right, we're here now. Hey. <laughs> Mine heard the same one. Yeah, mine heard cat break. <laughs> Look at it. It's a cat party. Ay, ay. <laughs> All right. Cats everywhere. And I'm Tank like, wants tank? nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, no, Tank's going to get riled up. Let's not do that to him. All right. Let He's me off get... taking a cat nap himself, actually. Oh, hey. Oh, so cute. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about that, y'all. Well, not, I'm not sorry. You're welcome. All right, we're gonna do speech dif uh, speech dif speech disabilities next. I really wish oh. that we had a we have a. I peek at Graham's question, um, and I think that it's an interesting one. Uh, did you say? Oh, this see? is a good one. Yes, go ahead and read it. Okay, um, so Graham says and asks sign language user with quotes is a strange thing we say i say it too but it is a language so should we not say sign language speaker genuine question i've never thought about it before. um i would definitely say that you should probably say sign language speaker uh, well speaker i think we I should know. probably refer to a group that you know, see see what folks who are native sign language users or, you know, whatever, what they call it. I think that would be the best way. Yeah. I'm gonna see sign if language I can... user versus speaker. Hmm. That's actually a really good question. And one that I'm going to actually just write down to have in my back pocket. User versus speaker. Sign language. Um, shoot, that's something I could like tweet after this and maybe someone will answer that for us. All right, let's go up to, what do we say was next? Speech. So these are not in order, sorry y'all, because the CPAC did it in a weird way where um, basically they do the disorders first and then they do all the assistive technology together and I figured it would be easier to just do them together. All right, let's talk about speech disabilities. I was hopeful that we would have a speech therapist in the building, but um, I think we have maybe two speech therapists in our group and they can't make it to the lives. So no speech therapist with us, but we know a little bit about this stuff. Okay, so it's a range from mild slurred speech to complete inability to speak. May be able to read, write, and understand language, and it's caused by a side effect of an underlying disability. So what do you all think are some barriers that speech disabilities could have? Like, what do you think is if you can't speak, if you have no speech output because of uh, like physically or you have something else going on that causes speech to be something that you cannot do? All right, so CJ Dream said phone use, yes. Uh, maybe talking on the phone would be hard, but there are ways to get around it that we can talk about. 
Uh, Graham said, big barrier for mild disabilities is people completing sentences or interrupting. Yes, that's a big one. Um, oh my goodness said, if tech requires speech like Siri activation, yes, yes. Sinotech said, slower communication. So CJ Dreams, you said phone use. That's where assistive technology would come in, right? So someone who cannot speak, but still wants to use the phone can still use the phone because they can use a device that has speech output. So they can hear you, but you'd be speaking to maybe a, like a, a assistive technology device that I think it's called augmented, in, it's an AAC is what they call it, augmented communication device. Um, essentially. So something that's outputting as you type. And then Graham said, essentially though, the barriers as a developer is that you do not provide alternative communication methods. Right. So anything that's text based that requires speech would be a problem. All right. So that's just generally. So no speech. So these are people who have no speech whatsoever none at all, would be mutism, inability to speak due, due to a brain injury, um, emotional trauma, or the speech muscles not moving. So those are all the things that can cause you to just be completely unable to use your voice. And then we have things like aphasia, where it's an impairment of a language affecting production or comprehension of speech and an inability to read or write. Um, that's usually almost due always due to brain injury, usually stroke or older individuals or brain tumors, infections, and head trauma. Okay, sorry, I gotta move this guy. You're like in <laughs> my screen. All right, let's go over to some of the assistive technology and hopefully I will have some better words than what I just said to explain it. Um, All right, so I like, I think when I was doing occupational therapy, like 80% of when I was working in schools, particularly, I would say 75% of the students that I saw had speech difficulties and used assistive technology to output their, their speech. And there's many different types of assistive technology for that. Like the ones on here are basically these big boards that have a bunch of different pictures on them and that's how they learn how to kind of communicate so if they see the picture they tap on it and it'll say happy right or i want water or i need to use the bathroom so that's kind of how they learn at first and this can be very high tech like a whole ipad where you can type out and look at different icons to speak very quickly and it can be extremely low tech as in like I have a piece of paper with yes and no on it and I point at yes and no. So that's all. I have literally drawn them on whiteboards. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and that goes for adults and children who are who have speech difficulties. So when I see adults who may have lost their speech, like we have to start from the bottom and often it's all about pointing and, and kind of we go from there. So what the CPAC wants you to know is that articulation, okay, here we go. Articulation aids, augmentative and alternative communication devices. <laughs> Goodness, AAC. Um, that's what they use and that's what I just explained. So that's the speech to text. Also those electronic communication boards are what you see right here. So this is a, electronic communication board. This one's an electric one, this one, anything that's electric, right? Um, there's also keyboards with speech generating functionalities. Um, and they're pretty much just keyboards that like just speak out and they're only made for that. But I think a lot of people these days, they just use like their phone because it's easy, quick to get to. And there's always a way to kind of do speech to text or text to speech very nicely. All right, so that's all of the assistive technology. Let's talk about adaptations. Adaptations would be writing templates, organizational tools, word prediction, spell check. Um, RoboDom said, in my previous line of work, we definitely made use of comm boards. Sometimes it was even for people who had speech difficulties. We 
also use them for people whose primary language wasn't English. So that's another really good point, right? So we talk about a lot about disabilities, but how web accessibility helps everyone. So in this case, like these assistive technology devices do help different types of people. Just like when we talk about screen readers, we talk about screen readers, we, we think only for blind, like blind people use screen readers when it's other people are using them too. People with reading dif difficulties and things like that. Um, also, Graham, Graham said they all sound like adaptations for people with cognitive disabilities, not speech related. And you may be right. So we're going to look at the CPAC. So y'all have to forgive me. Sometimes, you know, I got a lot going on and I may put the wrong information in here, which is why you're here with me to call me out and we I can look at the CPAC. Sometimes this is an interesting, like an interesting split, right? Uh, if you have a stroke, you have both cognitive things right. and physical things going on. Um, so there are parts of your brain that if the stroke affects that, you're not going to be able to either understand or process the words uh, to put them out. And so that would be like a cognitive speech dis disability. Right. You could also have parts of your brain that are controlling like your tongue and your mouth shape, meaning that you can't put the words out. And that would be more like a cognitive physical disability. Mm -hmm. um, and those, those both I think fall under speech because speech is a very like complex, complicated coordination, um, brain processing thing. Right. Does that all make sense? I just kind of like went off. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. And that was really good that you mentioned that. Um, Sinotech said the cut corner example hasn't left my mind since last week, but I cannot remember. I was going to say, can somebody what remind me? I didn't watch the whole video. Um, what was? And then Sino said, I've been throwing it around my conversations like it's nobody's business. Sino, what is the cut corner? I forgot already. Do you remember, Dorlin? What was the term? Cut corner example. Oh, the curb cut example. Oh, the curb cut. Right? Is that the one he's talking yes, about yes, with the what, sidewalks? That is what you're talking about. Yeah. Designing Everyone benefits. cut corner wheelchair. Yes. Yeah. So we talked you about last time um, how curb corners, right? The The ramping of it helps all of us, helps wheelchair users, people with strollers, people on bikes, things like that. <laughs> Thank you, Sino. All right. Also, um, if I'm using the wrong pronouns for anybody, my bad, please let me know. So now what we're doing right now is just making sure that what I read was what the CPAC wants us to know. So while we know that we need the cognitive stuff, we know, well, thank you, Brandy. Let's see if, <laughs> let's see if I was wrong about this. All right. So the technology. Voice carryover, text-based alternatives, smartphone act applications, text-to-speech software, Hey, that was it. So I think this may have been something that I didn't mean to put in here. Maybe because I don't see it under here. I think this might have been. So this to me is what I would put under like ADHD. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's what it's for, but that's like looking at it with my, you know, my my understanding this would be ADHD. it's too small for me to read right now what is it it says writing templates organizational tools word prediction spell check would be um an adaptation so i think this one might have been i'm just going to delete it um all right because i would like to send this to y'all i just didn't finish it and i want to send y'all something that looked ridiculous okay so 
Happy, happy Joyce Joy. Hey, former SLP here. She's right. Sometimes cognitive disabilities create speech disabilities. Graham said, yeah, I did not want to imply that they were not applicable. It was just the organizational tools that made me think, no, we're not going to ignore you, Graham. You were actually right. That, <laughs> that didn't belong there. So we really appreciate you. Okay, so now we're at the part of me and Brandy's Oh no, Brandy! It's five o'clock. Brandy has to go on a, a run a, with her it's wife. It's okay, actually. I uh, I asked, and a little bit late is okay. Okay, well, <laughs> especially if it means that we're we're to my uh, to my strength. Yes, yes, we are. So after this one, feel free to skedaddle. Um, we'll probably skedaddle ourselves not too far after this. Okay, so here's me and Brandy's favorite part, essentially, because this is what we do. <laughs> Did did make that past tense because <laughs> we have ptsd <laughs> we learned at work that we have pts work related ptsd <laughs> all right um mobility flexibility and body structure disabilities so this would be a real a really large population of people i think almost all of us at some point will have some type of mobility issue even somebody, if I was going to say, somebody in the Discord said that they heard a talk and, and the presenter was saying yes. that unless you die suddenly, you will be disabled at some point. Period. Yes. And, that and is... I would even say, like, if you're including temporary disabilities, that, that shoots much higher. Well, yeah. I think that number does include temporary disabilities. You know, like, because yeah. it's everybody at some point if you don't, you know? Yeah. We will all be disabled at any, like, at some point in life. It is what it is. Um, so I think it's interesting to learn about. And Dorlin, just so you know, because this is a funny picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of all time. <laughs> it's a picture. Okay. How do I even explain this without laughing? <laughs> I can do it. I can take it. Okay. Go for it. Uh, it is somebody's two hands uh, in like home row position on a keyboard and on every finger they have those little like plastic puppet hands. So <laughs> there are 10 little hands, which makes for what, like 50 little fingers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. It yes. looks ridiculous too. All right. So mobility impairments include upper, lower limb loss, disabilities, manual dexterity or fine motor loss, ambulation dif difficulties, which is um, Brandy's specialty, muscle fatigue, body size or shape issues. Um, let's see. So what do we think barriers for people who have mobility and flex flexibility issues may find? So we're talking about people who have weakness, right? Strength loss, um, poor coordination. So the ability to use like maybe both hands or both sides of the body at the same time, uh, poor range of motion. So maybe they may be spastic and can't even bend their hand this way to type um, with the hands down. So what, what barriers do you think we'd find? And we're gonna we're gonna put this technology wise. What are some barriers? I'm totally having that like middle school moment of me being like, oh, oh, oh. All right, we're gonna let someone answer <laughs> first. <laughs> we'll let you guys think about it, and then Brandy's gonna answer. All right, so Graham said thousands can be from holding a pen to entering a building. So Graham, what what do you think they would have trouble with you, as far as using technology goes? What would be something that they may have to like use assistive technology to complete? Sinotech said, dude, my finger is messed up like every other week and my back is tight all the time from sitting all day. Oh. All right, oh my goodness said, a barrier would be not to be able to use a pointer like a mouse. Yes, yes. Keyboard only users make up a lot of the web. Graham said, typing, mouse accuracy, tap target size, et. Yes, I, yes, yes, Graham. 
that's actually something we should talk about in like way more detail, but that we probably don't have much time to do today. Um, and we will be talking about, especially as we start coding, which is things like tap size. How, how do we think about tap size? How do we think about like using the keyboard and things like that? So Brandy, take it away. Tell us, tell us more. Uh, so I mentioned um, definitely when we're talking about typing, um, so typing speed, we might need extra time for like filling out forms, things like that. Um, also doing- <laughs> Graham just said uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also doing things like um, if you have multiple disabilities, uh, I find like I've been using JAWS, using layered commands where you're using two, three, four keys at once. Um, if you have something like RA or spasticity, you're not able to have, you know, full reach, you're going to have a lot more difficulty with that. Um, I, I sent you a picture and now I can't access it. <laughs> you sent me a picture? I wrote a whole list. I wrote a list. Oh, the picture. Um, is, okay, hold yeah. on, let me look at it. So Brandy sent um, me a, pic, a handwritten note. Yes, I did. <laughs> it is, it says mobility, flexible, mobility, flexibility, and body structures. Oh. Sorry. RA, <laughs> oh, you put R-A-O-A, so. Um, yeah, so that would be rheumatoid arthritis. arthritis and osteoarthritis. Right. Uh, one of them being an immuno condition, the other being an age condition. Pain disorders like fibromyalgia, um, coordinating then, movements. I think you you said everything on here pretty good. So, sweet. <laughs> nice. So another one that's interesting um, that I think people don't think about that much is some people cannot even use a keyboard, right? They can't use a keyboard. They can't use a mouse. Um, so they have to use other things to select things on the screen. So those things can look like huge buttons and switches where they're just typing or tapping. It can be things like eye gaze, etc. So the barriers really are that we need some way to use the device. So let's talk about those ways that we're going to use. All right, here we go. All right, so mobility assistive technology. I'm gonna explain what's on my screen. Um, the first picture is a picture of a woman sitting at a computer. She is. She has a pen in her mouth that's like a pointer, so it's in her mouth. There is a keyboard that is sitting upright with a bunch of keys. They're kind of curved. So it looks like a keyboard, but it looks like a really a really complex, larger keyboard, and she's using the stick in her mouth to select the keys. So this person, what do you think this person may be having trouble with? Like, it's probably that they can't use their hands, so they're using their mouth. Um, that's one way to get to stuff. We talked about switches. So here's an example of some of those switches that I was talking about. Uh, I wonder if I can make this bigger. I'm just gonna blow it up so you can see all of it for now and move this lady out the way. So on the screen are a bunch of different types of switches. There's these flat switches where all you have to do is kind of like tap it. It requires a little less um, accuracy when it's the flat ones because you're kind of just like touching. So this is for someone who just has a really hard time with uh, accuracy. There's other They're ones. also usually very, very sensitive. Right. Right. Uh, like the difference between like a mechanical keyboard and I don't know, like the the gentle tap of your trackpad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are very sen like very sensitive as in boom, you touch it and whatever it's connected to is selected. Um, and, and usually you, you plug these into like a laptop or a computer and then you run a program where it, there's one action that needs to happen. So these are more like for, for training. A lot of times it's training purposes to show people how to use it. So they'll be playing a game where if you click it, you, it feeds something or something like that. Um, then we have these bigger buttons. These ones are like, like Brandy was talking about, like a tactile keyboard. Um, like the one that I have where you press on it and it gives you the feedback. Um, and that 
is usually better for those who have trouble kind of finding their hand in space um, because it gives them the feedback like I'm pushing down and something is happening versus someone where it's more like they just, you know, they don't have a lot of control over their hand itself. So they're just trying to tap anything. So this is more for someone who needs the feedback. Um, See, I accidentally deleted that. And then these ones, there's like a little rubber ducky. Um, these are for kids. So the, this little frog right here, you squeeze the frog and then something happens. So it's just teaching them like, okay, if I do something, something else happens and it's helping them use it. Ali, Her Ali Herrera said, I've used eye gaze communications with spinal cord injury patients. Me too. Yeah. I, the eye gaze was like what made me be like, I want to work and just do assistive technology, period. Because I, I <clears throat> a long time ago, had a patient without giving any identifying information who we assumed, I, don't, I think I might have mentioned it last stream, I don't remember, but we assumed that they couldn't speak, right? That they were not there anymore. This is spinal cord and brain injury. Um, we hooked them up to an eye gaze machine and this person <laughs> started talking with us. We taught, you know, we taught them yes, no, all, like, you know, built it up and we were able to communicate with them. So little things like that are really interesting. So also on here is this eye gaze. This is an eye gaze one right here. So she has a uh, glasses on, but you put a piece on the eye, on the eyeglasses. Um, Graham said an eye twitch sensor that Steve Hawkins uses as a switch. So there's ones where it's like a fit, you can do eye gaze or you can do head gaze. Um, and there's like a band around your head and when you move, it selects something. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Cenotech says, I've seen people navigate with their feet. It's impressive, right? Also, there's this one right here. I'm thinking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brandy. This looks like a sip and puff, right? Some type of like puff. Uh, it's too small for me to see right now. Right, let me... You're on my phone. I use oh. a mini. <laughs> I feel like this is a, uh, this is a sensor like you puff or you, and you sip and based off of like the pressure, that's how it selects things. So you can uh, drive a wheelchair with just using your breath. Your sip and puff, yeah. Yeah, sip and puff. So when you sip, it goes backwards. When you puff, it goes forwards. The harder you puff, the faster you go. It's really cool. And it can be like you can have software to use it to navigate uh, like computers, websites, right. do, do, you know, key, virtual keyboards. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what this person or is again, doing. like those icon, icon screens. Right. Yeah. Robo Dom said sip and puffs are so innovative. Yeah, they're really interesting. The first time I saw one was in grad school when I was in OT school and I was just blown away. I was like, this is yeah. so cool. I love that you use that word innovative because I usually think of innovative things as like new and sip and puffs have been around for a while. But the fact that they thought about it, I'm just like, yeah, it's going to no. be innovative forever to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Graham said, no, at one point there was one muscle he could use. So they used a method, a method whereby squeezing his cheek muscles and blinking an infrared switch was activated and he was able to scan and select characters on the screen. And I think Graham's talking about, um, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking's. I actually didn't know no that. No S on the end of his Haw name. Hawking. Yeah. Don't want you to get it wrong on Jeopardy. <laughs> That's really cool. All right, let's let's get into it. I have a whole lot of text on here. Um, so I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna go through all of them, but let's see. We talked about switch devices. Y'all know what a switch device is now. We talked about adapt. We didn't really talk about adaptive keyboards. Um, talk about them really fast. Me and Dorlin were talking about adaptive keyboards this week, trying to find a braille keyboard or braille stickies. And then I came across a lot of the keyboards that I used to give um, recommendations for. And there are these really huge keyboards. Um, I'm gonna just show y'all, cause why not? Well, 
while you're looking for that, I'm also going to throw in um, some of the more like interesting uh, upper extremity prosthetics will also use either muscle twitch or uh, nerve conduction. They can measure the nerve conduction through skin uh, to run actuators for, for things like grip or like pronation, supination, which is this motion, uh, turning my hand up or turning my hand down for those who don't know that word. <laughs> um, um, it's very, very cool. Can you say that one more time? Because I don't want to repeat what you just said because I just thought of something. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was filling space, uh, but kind of playing off of what Graham was saying about Stephen Hawking, not Hawking, uh, <laughs> using uh, just a few muscles to, to do scan and select um, some of the more interesting upper extremity prosthetics. Yes! Can use either That's muscle twitch. <laughs> or uh, transdermal uh, nerve readings to, to do different actuating motions for the prosthetic. Right, right. So I've had patients where they lose a limb and they have to relearn how to use the prosthetic hand. And those are pretty hard to learn because they're activated by like very specific muscles. So they have to relearn how to activate these specific muscles so that they can grab, they can like grip and then release. It's all very fascinating stuff. But we have up here, um, it's not very big. I'm trying to find like, can I go on here and maybe see it bigger, guys? I don't know where it is. Whatever. But this right here is the one that I usually get for for most people because it's so huge. It makes it really easy to to get to the letters. And then you have ones like this. This is good because it's spaced out. So Dorlin, I have one that has huge letters and black keys on yellow, um, yellow key, black letters on yellow keys. I think that's the one we talked about at work that I was telling you about. And then the other one next to it is one where like the letters are very flat, but they're spaced much further away. So it's easier to get to it and then press down versus when they're all next to each other and they're raised. If you don't have coordination, then you're just kind of like rolling all over all of them. Um, so it's, these are like just different keyboards and stuff. All right, I just wanted to show you all that. All right, we have voice control. So if you can't use your hands, you can use your voice, right? We talked about the pointing devices, eye tracking, there's voice recognition uh, software, speech to text, customized keyboards. We talked about those mouth sticks. We talked about head wands. So the head wands are if you have use of your head, right? Because some people may only have use of their eyes. You can use the head, the head, head wands. Sip and puff is for if you can't use any of those other things. Oversized mouses or trackballs are another good thing. Wheelchairs. Um, and then adaptations are things like walkers, canes, crutches, manual and electric wheelchair, motorized scooters, gate trainers, auto type software, and stools. All right, so we're gonna say goodbye to Brandy so that she can go on her walk. And then we're okay, going great. to finish out like three more disorders and get out of here. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. It was great seeing the whole stream. Yes, thank you for hanging out with us and giving us your expertise. I'm sure we will see you soon. <laughs> Probably. All good right. hanging out with you, Brandy. Have a good bike. I will. Bye, B. It's nice out. Bye. Bye. Oh, it's so great to have friends who are willing to stream with you. <laughs> All right. So let me do... All right, it's 526. Everyone take a break. Take a two minute break. All right, we're gonna come back and finish this thing out and we'll be out of here by six. All right? All right. All right. I'm gonna put this thing on BRB, play some jams and see y'all in two minutes. All right, awesome.
spooky doop. I am back. Back in the building. Ready to bang out the last of this. Let's see what's left. We skipped over deaf blind, so we'll start with deaf blind. Just trying to see what we have left. So we have deaf blind, cognitive disabilities, seizures, psychological. Okay, so that's actually quite a bit. So we're gonna go a little bit faster through these last few. Um, and next week we'll review them a little bit more better. So since we don't have that much time for these, it's gonna be up to you all to look through the body of knowledge and really read it and, and make sure you're pretty good on them. All right. Y'all still with me? Ooh, back and ready to do these last few. Sweet. Did we not do find this last week? Or maybe we just touched on it a bit because of the assistive technology overlap. What? Uh, talking about deaf blindness last week. Oh, we, I, did we do deaf? I think we did do deaf blind actually. I know. I'm not quite sure. I feel like we, we talked a lot about the assistive technologies that you would use as a deaf blind individual, but. Well, let's go through them briefly. Cause we, yeah, right. if you were here already, then you already kind of know all about deaf blind, but we'll go through it as a review. Here we go. All right. I see everybody said, let's go. Yep. Yep. Y'all ready. Great. Awesome. All right. So deaf blind, deaf blind is a very rare condition. It only affects 0.2 to 2% of the world's population. Seems like a very big gap. <laughs> We're gonna have to double check that one, but I'm pretty sure that I copied and pasted all this. So that has to be right, I guess. Um, most are not completely deaf or completely blind and retain some hearing or sight capability. So that to me, this sentence, most are not completely deaf or blind is important. Because I think that that is a common misconception that if you're deaf blind, then you have completely no um, no use of your your hearing or your sight, and that's really not the case most of the time, right? So when we talk about barriers, we know that their barriers are a lack of printed Braille on materials, websites, or tech that lack support of Braille keyboards. Dorlin was cool enough to show us her her Braille keyboard. Um, lack of transcripts, video, audio materials, lack of tactile sign language interpretation. So for deaf blind, what they're using primarily is going to be a Braille display. And we talked about Braille displays. They're pretty much assistive technology that you plug into your computer and it reads what's on the screen and outputs the display of Braille so that you can read line by line. So uh, deafblind is navigating the world completely by touch for the most part. Did I get everything, Dorlin? Mm hmm All right, so assistive technology looks pretty much the same for deafblind, but we're gonna just look at it really fast, just in case. Might not even be on here, because it's was part of the other one uh they have a section on it in the body of knowledge let's see i might have accidentally skipped it then all right let's go to the cpac just so we know what they want us to know this one i got too many things up here we go Body of knowledge for assistive technology, deaf blindness, challenges and solutions. All right, so assistive technology is screen readers, 
refreshable braille keyboard, printed braille, cane, service animal, tactile navigation aisles, tactile sign language interpretation, deafblind communications or communicator, transcripts for videos or audio. So all the things that we kind of talked about already. Okay, let's yeah. move on. Were you going to say something, Dorlin? Nope, I was just agreeing with you that we talked about a lot of it already. Okay. So we're going to go on to cognitive disabilities, which means we have to go back up to find that. All right, cognitive disabilities. And where did my OBS go? Oh, no. All right, so cognitive disabilities, they may occur on their own or they may be a symptom of something else going on or due to traumatic brain injury. They include intellectual disabilities, reading and dyslexia, math and computation, ADHD, autism, nonverbal learning disability, right? So their barriers are important, I think, because they are things that we do not think about when we're building websites, but are incredibly important. Right. So one of those things are complex sentences, jargon, unusual vocabulary. I don't know if it's on here, but acronyms is another one that really grinds my gears when you use an acronym like AAC, but you don't know what it means. Like maybe I know what an AAC is, but I couldn't even, you know what I mean? But do you know what it is? Right. So we always want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, complex page layouts and navigation. So things where we have to figure out where we're going that cause more than one step for us to get there, right? Animated blinking or flickering images are very, very, very distracting, especially for those with cognitive disabilities. Audio with no option to turn it off. These are high offenders um, and cause people to bounce very quickly from your websites. Um, also web browsers and media players that don't have any like controls for turning off animations, um, having complex visual des designs, um, and then social isolation discrimination. So just the feeling of not being accepted because of your cognitive disability. All right. And then we have a little, this is not really a meme. It's more like a comic in the first window. There's this little green guy in, in, in water and he says, help me, I'm drowning. And then the next pain, you see him like looking like he's about to drown and then someone's running towards him. And then in the third pain, it says, have you tried using a planner? And the person is like giving the person a planner in his hand, he's like underwater with his hand out. That's the only thing you can see and you can just see the planner. And then he grabs a planner and just sinks with it. And I think this is a really, good picture to have here because I feel like people, especially when you have cognitive disabilities or something like ADHD or autism, they're like, Oh, have you tried X, Y, Z? And you're like, bro, <laughs> like, uh, just help me please. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about, um, cognitive disabilities and assistive technology. Oh, maybe I already, I just did that. LOL. Or did I? There we go. Wait, no, you did Cognitive there. disabilities, assistive technology, and adaptive strategies. So when we have cognitive disabilities, here are some of the things that are very helpful for this population. Kathy Code said that feeling when you even forget that you have a planner. Like, you feel me? Like, <laughs> for real, though. RoboDom said that's a very morbid comic. That's why I chose it, RoboDom. I'm morbid. AF. All right. Assistive technology. Word prediction lookup. Word prediction is one that I that I know has changed people's lives. <laughs> Thank God for it. Um, especially if you have trouble reading or um, generating sentences, um, things like that. Simplified interfaces. I feel like Apple does a really good job of that, and that's why they're so popular. CJ Dream said, or when you ha make a to-do list and lose it. Man, I feel attacked. <laughs> 
uh, simplified content, augmentative, augmentative and alternative communication devices, AKA AAC, synchronized speech and highlighting. So synchronized speech and highlighting specifically for those who are not, uh, not aware is when something is reading, but it's as it reads, it's highlighting the word so that you can easily follow along and understand what's being conveyed to you. Um, it just makes it easier to read what's put before, before you and it allows you to read faster if you have processing difficulties when it comes to reading. Um, we also have visual audio alternatives to text like signages, messages, and instructions. Direct, uh, these, are these barriers? Let me see what I did here. No, that is under their list of strategies and. Okay, strategies. Sorry, my notes on this slide are a little wonky. All right, so some strategies for this population would be direct and immediate help for communication, like allowing adequate time to exchange information, giving feedback mechanisms, um, low tech message boards, computerized voiced output, communication aids, and synthesized speech. Another one I like that's on here is uh, choosing a quiet location for communicating. Oh, that is a good one. So that there's no visual discrap, there's no, there's no distractions. I'm gonna look at the CPAC real fast to see if I missed anything on this one. This is for speech, mobility, and duration, blah, 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 cognitive. So their adaptive strategies, I think I have this on here. Speaking slowly, checking for understanding. That's a good one. Checking for understanding. Um, okay, I like it. Let's move on to the next one. All right, we're gonna do seizures. Seizures, all right, meme time. All right, we have a meme with text when you ask them if they're having a seizure, but they just spasm on the ground instead of answering you. And it's Frodo from Lord of the Rings saying, all right then, keep your secrets. This one's really morbid, but it made me laugh and I felt bad afterwards. I shouldn't have put it on here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh man. Okay. Seizures. <laughs> <laughs> seizures are a disorder when seizures interfere with a person's regular activities and can range from mild to severe, including loss of consciousness. Yes. I, I too chuckled at that meme robo. I know people who have seizures who are really hilarious about it. So I feel like less bad about it. I think they'd laugh too. Maybe. I don't know. Anyways. All right. So we have two types of seizures. There's more than two types of seizures, but for the purposes of the CPAC, it appears that they want us to know about two specifically. And those two are general seizure disorders and photosensitive epilepsy. Um, so general seizure disorders affect 2% of the population. And that is a very large amount of the population, like a very large amount of people. Um, and that's when you have the sudden uncontrollable electrical disturbances of the brain that cause a change in behavior and um, changes the level of your co of consciousness. So these are like the, the classic seizures that you think of probably. Um, and then photosensitive epilepsy uh, are the ones that are triggered by flashes of light. And I think that's what a lot of people think of when they think about seizures, like having it happen because of those flashes of lights. All right. So the barriers for the most part, from my understanding is the fact that you can lose sudden consciousness. Um, so that makes a lot of things hard to do, like swimming, bathing, driving, using power tools, um, dealing with blinking, um, or flickering content on film. Actually, I just watched a, um, a video from Doja Cat. She came out with a new album is fire, but one of her videos is just like flashing lights. And it was like, 
it had to be on purpose. You get what I'm saying? Like, I, like edginess, but it was like flashing lights, like maybe 15 flashes rapidly. And I'm like, this will give someone a seizure like immediately. So I thought oh that was goodness. an interesting choice and I hope that it wasn't on purpose, but she is going through her, um, I don't give a F error. So <laughs> who knows? Uh, let's talk about some assistive technology and adaptations. Um, for general seizures, um, they have things like mobile digital diary apps with reminders, smart watches that detect seizures and send alerts and provide GPS location. That's really cool. Service animals. So service animals can detect when you're about to have a seizure and either alert you so that you can get somewhere safe or alert someone else so that they, they can get to you. Um, wearables. Some of them are also trained to help you fall safely. Wow. I know. Oh <laughs> They're <God>. amazing. <laughs> oh, service dogs. So Sorry, funny. go on. <laughs> service dogs. That's just like beyond. Um, wearables, like alert buttons to call for help. Um, you guys remember that commercial with like life alert? <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, protective gear and protective wear in case of a fall. Um, I know some kids wear helmets and things like that or padded clothing um, if you're that, you know, if you have seizures that often. RoboDom said, I don't have a diagnosis of seizures, but I can also see how all that sim stimulation, constant flashing lights can be disorienting to anyone. Yeah, and that's the other thing. A lot of these things we're talking about would be disorienting to anyone. It's just that for these people, it's life or death. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in the process of losing my sight, something that was like flashing would just completely f drown out all of my sight. And some, you know, so it's like something for the low vision folks is going to be hard to interpret too. Mm -hmm. And good, good catch, RoboDong. Yeah, that, that is, um, I'm glad you said that. That's interesting. Photosensitivity epilepsy. This, these are some of the things that um, will be helpful for them. Flicker free monitors. Um, my understanding is you can put like a, a little, uh, film over your screen, like, a uh, for, for things like that, kind of like how you would do a blue light screen, um, monitor glare guards, kind of the same thing. And then the non glare glasses. All right. I think we got about two more and about 13 minutes left of our time together. Thank you all for hanging out with me. Wow. Me and Dorlin. Appreciate y'all. Troopers. Real, real tears. Oh. A few of y'all left with us. All right, let's talk about heated seizures. Oh, we're on the last one. We're on the last one, y'all. Is psychological one's the last one? I think so. Oh no, actually, the last one is multiple. Yeah. But for some reason, I don't have a slide for that. I have a slide under assistive technology. So we got two more right on time, y'all. Except Beautiful. for the fact that we didn't get to get to disability etiquette. But that part is so fast that um, next week when we do it, we can do that with the other topic, which is going to be uh, accessible design or something. I don't remember. I got to look at it. I'll let you guys know at the end of this, though. We'll look at it. Psychological psychiatric disabilities. Let's get into it. We have social disabilities, so like social anxiety disorder. I have an anxiety disorder, but I am really good at pretending that I don't. Um, I want to throw up every time I speak in public <laughs> and faint when I'm getting better at it. That's 5% of the population. That's a whole lot of us. Um, emotional disabilities, that's 6.2% of the population. So that would be for those like with BPD, inability to uh, maintain interpersonal relationships, inappropriate behavior. So things like uh, uh, ODD, what does that even stand for? Uh, oppositional defiance disorder. I don't even know if that's still a thing anymore, but. <laughs> Never heard of that one. In my day, I had a whole lot of, uh, my uh, caseload had that. They would be wilding. All right, behavioral disabilities, that's 20% of the population. Patterns of disrupted behavior in children that last longer than six months. 
inattentive, hyperactive, impulsivity, drug use, defiance. I think behavioral, that's ODD, not emotional. Emotional, I think, is more like um, like a borderline personality disorder and things like that. But I could also be wrong about that. Now I'm trying to, you know, let's look at the CPAC real fast. Sorry, y'all. I just want to make sure that they didn't clarify this. Okay. Here we are right here. Emotional disabilities, inability to learn that can it be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors, inability to maintain satisfactory, and we have that one on there. Inappropriate types of behavior, feelings. Yeah, I would say that this is probably that that checks out. All right, I don't feel like I was wrong. All right, so some barriers would be limited availability and affordability of mental health services, lack of knowledge among, amongst healthcare providers of accurate diagnosis and treatment. That's actually a huge one. They were giving out OD diagnoses when I was doing therapy like candy, and I would see a lot of kids, particularly black kids, who would um, come away with ODD when it was not ODD, like, you know, one of those things. Social stigma is another thing that will happen. Let's see what we can do about it for um, some assistive technology. So we have things like behavioral charts. So um, that's something I used a lot when I was doing OT. We would have digital behavioral charts, things like tokens, giving stars, incentives, point sheets, goal tracking, um, noise monitoring devices, music as a therapeutic tool, positive reinforcement, um, and a lot of these were digital forms of that. Um, rewards such as video and arcade games, those are really good and motivating as well. Um, for social disabilities, we have things like apps for with mood, stress, and anxiety uh, management functions. So like the Mind or Calm apps where you can do guided meditation for like 15 minutes in a day or 30 minutes are very um, good. Um, RoboDom said, this is a fascinating area of tech, the concept of accessibility for all users with varying disabilities. Very eye-opening for a web dev like myself, taking into consideration of different barriers that affect user experience and interaction. Yeah, it is really interesting and it's, I, I like learning about this because it's like, now you're considering what everyone actually needs so that it's usable. Um, and it's not that hard to do, you know? All right, emotional disabilities, uh, things like text-to-speech software is pretty good, um, reminder devices, voice recognition software, noise monitoring devices again. All right, then we have multiple compound disabilities. So I'm gonna go over to the CPAC's body of knowledge um, because I did not make a slide for that one because all it's gonna say is everything combined essentially, but let's just see what the CPAC says with our last few minutes. Um. All right, so multiple or compound disabilities describe a phenomenon of more than one disability being present within a person at the same time. They can include physical, mental, or combination of types. In terms of education, this category is used for students with the most profound disabilities. It does not include deaf blindness because deaf blindness is its own thing if we remember. Um, so some characteristics include intellectual functioning, adaptive skills, motor skills, sensory functioning, and communication skills. Um, according to the US Department of Education, 5.9 million students receiving special education services in 2003 and four, um, of them, roughly 2% receive special education services based off of a classification of multiple disabilities. All right, so let's talk about some of the things. So pretty much for multiple slash compound disabilities, you can just assume that any of the things that we talked about 
will be something that they can use depending on whatever that disability is. And if the CPAC, I don't know if it's going to ask you this, right? If it asks you, what would you use for someone who's both, you know, XYZ and XYZ, you'll remember all of those things and be able to answer it, right? So next week, we're going to get into disability demographics and statistics. Um, and then we're going to get into disability etiquette. Um, and these ones are not as in depth in like wordy as what we just did. So I think that we'd be able to do these two and then get into accessibility and universal design. Um, I don't know if Sino is still with us, but I think this is the one that Sino wanted to co-stream on. I will double check. But um, maybe Dorlin will be with us. Oh, okay, yeah, Sino did say, yes, I am. So <clears throat> after accessibility and universal design is standards and laws, and that would be week four. So we're going to do standards and laws by itself. It's going to be its own thing. Um, I also feel like accessibility and uni universal design should be its own thing, but we're going to see if I'm going to figure it out, y'all. I'm going to let y'all know in the Discord, actually, because I feel like it should be its own thing. Um, but we'll see. I'm going to let you know. If anything, we may have to figure out extending out one more week, which may be beneficial if we're actually trying to pass this thing. But we'll see how it goes. Um, if anything, I'm going to do a run through myself and then see how long it takes me to get through it and decide based on that, because this all is taking way more time than we think. Um, it's probably because we're doing it in the format we're doing it with like a lot of talking and stuff. All right. We freaking did it. Oh my gosh. Two oh hours. Um, so this is the time to kind of do some housekeeping, ask questions, make comments, anything that you have to do for the group. Um, I would love to see it. Um, I wanted to talk about silent study as we've been talking about. A lot of people have uh, replied about the times that they're available. If you're here with me still and you are interested in silent study, please go over to the general Discord um, channel. There's a thread and you can put in the times that work for you. And then next week, I'm gonna put all those times together somehow because there's like seven different time zones in there. Um, and then see if there's general groups that overlap with each other. Um, all right, I'm gonna read some of these. Sino said, I was speed racing trying to make Anki cards. <laughs> I didn't even make any Anki cards today. That's awful. Um, another great session. Thank you so much. Thank you, CJ Dreams. And then Sino said, and it wasn't until the end that I realized I'm just going to have to go through the book anyway and remake all those cards, LOL. <laughs> Oops. Uh, Plants of Pajama said, thank you so much. Ali Herrera said, thank you all. Robo said, thanks for the stream. I appreciate y'all. We'll be here next week. We're going to be talking about those two topics that I talked about, and then we're going to do Anki to go through what we just went through. So I'm thinking that accessibility and universal design will have to be its own week and that next week we're going to end out with um, etiquette, disability, and Anki. Um, and if we have enough time and that goes by super fast for whichever reason, we'll start on accessibility and universal design. I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> All right. Thank you all, everyone. Any last words, Dorlin? No. Good job, everyone. That was fun. I did. I found a couple of missing headings within the CPAC body of knowledge while we were going through this, though. <laughs> so wow. That was fun. That is cool. I know, Look which cool. kind of made it harder for me to quickly navigate. Aww. And it's kind of case in point, but I made it work. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Hmm. <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll see you next week at 4 p.m. Same time, same place. Thank you so much for hanging out. I will see y'all in Discord. You got any questions? Discord is a place to go. Please let me know if you're interested in silent study, etc. Bye, my friends. Bye.